Hello, today we're going to talk about structure 3.2.7. This is a higher level topic. It's all about stereoisomers, which have different spatial arrangements of atoms. So let's break down the different types of isomers. There are two major types of isomers. Structural isomers, which we talked about in section six. And today we're going to talk about stereoisomers. Stereoisomers can be uh, categorized into two major types, conformational isomers, um, which involve rotation around a single bond, and then configurational isomers. And configurational have different configurations, but they are categorized further into cis-trans isomers and optical isomers. And so we're going to look at conformational, cis-trans, and optical isomers today. So conformational involves the rotation of a single bond, the free rotation of a single bond. Let's look at a really simple example. If I were to have something like um, like this, um, so this would be uh, one bromo two chloroethane. Because this is a single bond, the carbons are free to move around. Okay, they can rotate <clears throat> around that single bond. So that means that this molecule can rotate to form something like this. For example, but that means it's also free to move back around. It doesn't stay in any one particular configuration. Um, so this is just called a conformational isomer. Uh, so you guys should just kind of have an idea that those single bonds mean they're free to rotate around that space. And it doesn't really matter which way you draw them. They are the same molecule, all right? It becomes more of an issue when you have rings. And um, if you have something like a hexane ring, Right, a cyclohexane. Because those single bonds have a little bit of rotation to them, you wind up with um, two possible kind of formations there, where you wind up with a boat formation. And this takes a little bit of an imagination here. Imagine like our, he our hexagon was like the two ends were folded up. And if this is coming out of the page like this, I don't know if that really helped, but it, just imagine like the two sides of the hexagon are bent forward. Or you could wind up with something that we call a chair configuration, which looks kind of like this, where the two sides of your hexagon are bent in opposite directions. And that's possible, again, because the, the, the single bonds have some of the flexibility in their rotation. And um, you don't have to be able to draw chair and boat, but I just want to, to kind of point out why it's important that we talk about conformational isomers, um, because whether it's a chair or a boat is going to affect reactivity sometimes. Okay, so I just want to briefly define configurational isomers. Configurational isomers have different configurations. They are stuck in a particular configuration. Um, so let me give you an example here. If I have like this, and I want to compare that with the example on the last page. Something has to help it stick in the same position. So in this case, the double bond is not free to rotate. So that bromine and the chlorine are always going to be on the same side of the double bond. Whereas if you have a single bond, they're free to rotate and the chlorine might wind up in a different position relative to the bromine. So configurational, stuck in a particular configuration. So one type of configurational isomer is called a cis-trans isomer. And if you have a double bond like this, you could have the elements on different sides of the double bond like this. And 
I always want you to imagine the plane of the double bond. If the two special things are on the same side, that is called the cis isomer. And if the two special things are on opposite sides of the double bond, that is called the trans isomer. We usually stick the word cis or trans at the very front of the name to indicate whether it's the cis or trans version of that molecule. You can also have cis or trans isomers for rings, which is interesting. So let me, um, if I have something like cyclobutane, I'm going to draw like this. Um, so that's cyclobutane. I could have a bromine and a chlorine like this, and then hydrogens. And then let me draw another version. So when we're dealing with cis-trans isomers for ring structures, we're talking about above or below the ring. In this case, I have one above and one below. This would be the trans isomer. And this one, where they're both on the same side of the ring, this one's the cis isomer. The last type of stereoisomer is called optical isomer. And that's because these kinds of isomers are optically active. Now, what does that mean? So if I were to take one of the isomers, and let's say I just have a liquid version of this, I can take a light source and pass it through a polarizer. And the polarizer gets it so that there's just one direction of light, one plane of light. And if that goes through an optically active substance, the plane of light gets rotated. So it's like, that is not a very good drawing. Let me see it. Like, imagine you're going to look, this is your eye, you're going to look down this way, okay? If you're looking down, originally you just have the wave in um, up and down, okay? A lot of people like to use the example of if you have a fence, like a fence slat, only the light that is going up and down will be able to fit through a fence slat, and that's what the polarizer does. It's just one direction wave. So let's imagine our wave is just up and down in one direction. When it passes through the substance then, that is going to rotate it slightly. So now it's at an angle. And it might rotate it to the left or the right, um, depending on the particular isomer. So that's where you get there's two isomers. One of the isomers is going to rotate it one direction. And if you were to test a different isomer, it's going to rotate it the other direction. Uh, so that's isomers, optical isomers. We also call these enantiomers. And they are non-superimposable, non-superimposable mirror images of each other. So let me give you a very simple example. Okay, nope, that's not a good, let me use a methyl group like this. So this is like a 1-bromo-1-chloroethane is the name of the molecule there. If I were to take a mirror image of this, imagine this is our mirror, I'm going to have the chlorine, the bromine, the methyl group, and the hydrogen. This substance, if I were to move it right on top of the other one, it's not superimposable. It's not the same compound as it was before because now the methane is in a whole different spot. Even if I were to rotate it around to put the chlorine and the bromine in the same position, the methane 
the methyl group and the hydrogen will have swapped. I really encourage you to build a 3D model of enantiomers so you can see how they are not superimposable. It really, really helps. You also need to be comfortable in drawing these wedge dash structures. Okay, so showing that one of the um, constituents, one of the substituents, I'm sorry, around the carbon is coming forward from the page with this wedge. One of the substituents is going back behind the page with the dashed lines, and two of them are in the plane of the page. The good thing is when you have to draw the mirror image, you can just um, flip it, which makes it really nice and easy. And so if you were to have just a solution of this, it's going to rotate the plane polarized light in one direction. If I had just a, mix, uh, a sample of this other isomer, it's going to rotate the plane of polarized light in the opposite direction. Okay, um, two other kind of related concepts with these optical isomers are the, this concept of a racemic mixture. Um, so if I were to have those two isomers that I have on the previous page with my methyl group going into the back of the page and my hydrogen coming out of the page, each one on their own would rotate light in opposite directions. Maybe this one goes clockwise and this one goes counterclockwise. If you were to have a mixture of the two, what we call a racemic mixture, it, it would cancel each other out. So when you mix them together, there would be no effect. They would not rotate the plane of polarized light because they cancel each other out. You should also have an idea that the two different isomers are going to react differently. Um, because they have different positionality, different you know, 3D spatial arrangement, they could have different specificity for enzymes, if, especially for these biological molecules, um, or they could just you know, have different reactivities in general. And you need to be very careful with that, especially in things like drug design, pharmaceuticals, um, or um, there are certain types of organic synthesis. If you're making certain compounds, you'll have to use specific methods to get the optical isomer that you're looking for. So how can you tell if something is going to have an optical isomer? The easiest way to tell is by looking for chiral carbons. Chiral carbon. Um, so it's a lot of times people talk about chirality. A chiral carbon is a carbon that has four different things around it. Four completely different things. So like A, B, C, D. Nothing can repeat there or else you're going to be able to superimpose the mirror image. Um, so a lot of times they'll like to try to trick you with something like this. If I have CH3, CH, Br, CH3, or CH3, CH, Br, CH2, CH3. Condensed structural formulas, it's very difficult to see whether any of the carbons are chiral. So I recommend, strongly recommend, that you draw them out. In this first one, this is a bromopropane, you have a CH3 attached to a carbon. That carbon has a hydrogen and a bromine, and then there's another methyl group. This central carbon here is not chiral because it has two of the same group, two methyl groups attached to it. Not chiral. Now let's look at the second example here. I have a CH3, C with an H, and a Br, and then a CH2, and a CH3. Well, this one, this carbon in the middle here, is chiral because it has a methyl group, a hydrogen, an ethyl group, and a bromine. Those are four different things. So I could draw this using that wedge dash notation and draw a mirror image that is not superimposable. So we're looking for the chiral carbon, the carbon with four distinctly different things attached to it. That's going to give it that optical activity. So let's do some examples with this. Draw the enantiomers of 2-hydroxy propanoic acid, lactic acid. 
so the first thing you should draw, just draw a structural formula that's going to help you. Propanoic acid is our parent. There's our propanoic acid, and then 2-hydroxy. And then I'm going to fill in the other hydrogens there. 2-hydroxy propanoic acid. Then it says, mark the chiral atom and show the plane of the mirror. Um, this carbon cannot be chiral. It has three of the same hydrogens around it. This one cannot be chiral. It has a double bond that automatically makes it not chiral. So it's got to be this one. That one is the chiral atom. So when I'm going to draw it, this is our chiral. I'm going to draw it um, to make it a little easier on us. We're going to do the OH and the H. Then I'm going to show my wedge and dash. Remember, we can abbreviate carboxylic acids as COOH. And then I have my methyl group on the other side, the CH3. And to draw the other version, I'm just going to I flip the ones that are in the plane first. Then I mark the wedge. It's always going to be the same thing. And the same thing going back to the dash. And so those are my two enantiomers with the chiral carbon marked. Here's another example. I have um, transbutatuene and cisbutatuene. Um, I'll draw the generic first. There's butatuene. I can draw this as a cis and trans isomer. If I want to draw it as a trans isomer, I need to show that the carbons are going on opposite sides of the double bond. And I'll do it like this, CH3. So this one would be the trans isomer. And if I were to draw the cis isomer, the carbons would be on the same side of the double bond. Like this. And so this would be cisbutatuene. And our last um, stereoisomer here, example, structural formula for trans 1, 2 dibromocyclobutane, and it's cis stereoisomer. Cyclobutane is our original there. And we want trans 1, 2 dibromo. So you just need to pick 1 and 2. Trans, I'm going to have a bromine going up and a bromine going down from the ring. And then I, you need to fill in the hydrogens. Up, down, up, down, down. There is our trans isomer. Then our cis version of that, you're going to have our same four carbons, but on the same side of the ring. And you could put them either both going up or both going down. It doesn't matter. But now this is the cis isomer.